Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is a chartered financial analyst and a portfolio manager for RIA Advisors. He works with Lance Roberts. He's an author and also a partner for Real Investment Advisors and Simple Visor. Michael Leibowitz, thank you for joining me again. Thanks for having me. It's been a while. Yeah, I didn't do a lot of these long interviews for a while. I had a lot of health problems, but now I'm feeling a little bit better. So I'm starting to do these interviews. I know you've been covering the bond market a lot, U.S. Treasuries. And now here we have what's going on with the yield curve. The Fed is still raising interest rates. We're recording this interview on Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. I, and I think Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, just said that he want he at the December meeting, he's going to be raising interest rates, what, another 50 basis points approximately. So it looks like the pace of interest rate increases will slow down in the near future. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's kind of like saying the baseball game is going to end soon when you're in the seventh inning. The Fed has raised rates quite a bit here. And Everyone knows that each time they raise rates by default, they're closer to the terminal rate, to the end game. So uh, Powell today kind of stated the obvious. He said, we're getting closer to getting to that rate that we think is the end rate. And that as we get close to that rate, we're going to slow down the pace of rate hikes. The market was priced for 50 basis points at the meeting in mid-December. And then it's priced for two to three more rate hikes of 25 basis points. So in my opinion, Powell said what the market was thinking and what he's been saying and what other people have been saying, uh, but the market loved it. Not sure what it really liked about it. Not sure if the rally will last. I'm also kind of concerned now that Powell can't be too happy with the market's reaction So when we get to December 14th, which is the next Fed meeting, a little concern that Powell Powell puts the kibosh on, uh, you know, on on this stock market again, just trying to, you know, whack it back down again so that financial conditions are become tighter. Yeah, I don't think this stock market rally for the general stock market for the U.S. stocks is based on fundamentals. I think it's probably based on liquidity and the Fed doing a 180. The dollar index dropped below 106. It was, it's at 105.85 and the gold price had a nice, the paper gold price in U.S. dollars had a nice rally on the comments from Jerome Powell. But I want to ask you about financial history and the yield curve. So as of right now, approximately 76% of the yield curve is inverted. What does an inverted yield curve historically mean for the real economy in the U.S. and also for different asset prices? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So what does an inverted yield curve in terms of financial history, what does it historically mean for the U.S. economy and also for other asset prices? Sorry, I missed the word inverted and I was a little confused. Uh, So before we kind of talk about what it means, let's just think about what it what the yield curve, why the yield curve matters so much. Banks tend to borrow short. They take our deposits in, which are considered short-term borrowings, uh, and they lend long. So they're lending for cars at five to seven years. They're lending houses at 30 years. They're lending to corporations, et cetera. So they, what they try to do is, is profit from both from a credit perspective by uh, you know, taking on credit risk, but they also typically try to profit from the yield curve. The fact that the one-year rate should be lower than the five-year rate or 10-year rate. Uh, and, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, that's the case, that the yield curve is upward sloping. But what we find is as we get towards recessions, the Fed it's, you know, kind of the Fed is raising rates. So short term rates start rising. Today, they're rising aggressively. But the long end of the bond curve starts, you know, flattening or even falling in yield because they sense a they sense a recession, they sense what the Fed is doing. And that's exactly what's played out this time. The, uh, the yield curve, you know, and you can look at virtually any yield curve is getting pretty inverted here. The Fed's favorite is the three-month 10-year. And if you look at that yield curve, it's inverted 
I want to say 50 or 60 basis points right now. And it's just going to further invert more as the market continues to price in what they know the Fed will do. We know the Fed's going to do at least 50 in December, and we're pretty confident they'll do at least two more 25s. So as time progresses, you start capturing more of those periods with those higher Fed funds rate. So the three month is going up in yield. At the same time, the long end of the bond curve is very concerned that the Fed is going to generate a recession. It's also getting a little more confident that inflation is coming down. So the curve's inverted pretty decently now and will only get further inverted. So when we look at inversions, and again, considering that lending, debt, which is what drives our economy these days, whether you like it or not, that is the driver, is not very profitable right now from a traditional bank point of view. So by default, banks are just going to make less loans, which which kind of fuel economic activity. Uh, so again, if you look at yield curves, what you tend to find is that the yield curve inverts and inverts until the point where the Fed comes to the rescue. Now, that's t- typically when the curve starts uninverting, we're already in a recession. Uh, and then the curve steepens back out rather rapidly through the recession as the Fed brings r- short rates down much faster than long rates are falling. So in a recession so, is a seven, the according to hedge fund manager Tavi Costa at Crescott Capital, about 76% of the yield curve is inverted. Is that normal then for a recession in the past in the US for the for the yield curve, that much of the yield curve to be inverted? Yeah. And that's what we have today, where roughly 70% of the yield curves are inverted. Um, It it looks like every... I have a a picture up on my screen right now of the 10-year, three-month treasury curve. And it looks like every period that... This has happened eight times since the, like, called 1960. Eight times we've had a recession. Uh, If you just look at the graph, it doesn't look any different than what we saw in 2007, 2001, 1990, and you can go back in time and see the same thing. But what you'll also notice when you look at it is that the the yield curve has to start going back to a normal shape. And actually the last three recessions, even including 2020, that was a kind of a different type of recession. But if you look at the big boy recessions, 1990, 2000, 2008, the curve was already back to being almost uh, was back to a a positive slope curve, and in two of the three times, it was back up to one percent. So, you know, if you're if you're kind of thinking about, well, when's a recession coming? The answer may be that we have to wait for the yield curve to get to a positive shape, which means that the the market has to be pricing in Fed rate cuts. And we're just not there yet. So when you start thinking about recession odds, it may not be till March, you know, may not be till June until, you know, we really start feeling the effects uh, and we get real true, you know, a more true recession if we are going to have one. You mean an Um, official recession according to U.S. government statistics from the Federal Reserve Bank or the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Because the the Q3 earnings, I mean, are real bad. They're dealing with higher energy costs. Consumer sales are down. We just had Black Friday and Cyber Monday. The the nominal amount of sales was fairly high, fairly consistent with the past. But the amount of discounting, deep discounting that these retailers were doing 20, 30, 40, 50 percent before Christmas, pretty crazy just to get any sales. Here's the problem with a recession today. You have inflation at, let's just say it's 7%. You know, that's another thing we can debate all day, but let's just call it 7%. For the, on a real basis, we can have negative sales, but on a nominal basis, GDP has to fall 7%, you know, has to be, for GDP to be zero is a pretty big deal because prices are growing at such a high clip. So, you know, we can have two, three, four percent nominal growth. And to me, that would be a recession because real growth would be minus two or three or four percent. But things are still growing purely because of inflation. 
it, just everything ever since COVID has been very tricky to read. You know, we can look at the employment data. It's still very a very robust labor market. There, there are some small signs that the labor market's starting to deteriorate, but they're not, they're not terribly concerning. And, you know, we're still in almost all data posting really strong numbers. Um, yeah, you know, we certainly heard from Target and Walmart that they have inventory problems that they're discounting that, that Black Friday was not great. Um, the consumer, you know, so that leads us to the consumer and consumption is two thirds of the economy. The problem we're having or that we, we will be having soon is that if you look at savings rates, they're down to 20 plus year lows. And if you look at the growth of revolving credit over the last six months, nine months, it's at 20 year highs. So, so you're tra- are, by revolving credit, are you talking corporation credit, credit or oh, so no, you're talking no. consumer credit card debt then? It, it, well, it's consumer revolving credit. So there are other things in there, but it's predominantly credit card debt. So, so what's the consumer doing? They want to keep up their consumption as it was last year, but they don't have the means because they haven't, you know, because they've gotten pay increases, but they haven't kept up with inflation. So, you know, the first thing you do is you draw down your savings. Second thing you do is you rely on your credit card and those both work and they can work for a while, but they're, you know, obviously savings is very limited. You draw your savings to zero, you're done, or you draw it down to an amount that you feel is, you know, kind of that, that bare minimum that you want. Then you, then you start leaning on credit cards and you got the same problem there. You got credit card limits. And how much debt do you really want to carry on a credit card? And credit card interest rates are now up about 3% over the last six months. And the way that those credit card companies calculate your interest expense is very daunting. Um, so, you know, consumers are slowly but sure, surely hitting the wall, but it still could be another few months. So I think we are looking at a recession, but it may not be, you know, it, it certainly seems like it should be happening now, but it may not be for another few months. And then, Jason, the other big thing that I just don't hear enough of, interest rate hikes take a long time to work their way through the economy. Typically, anywhere from six six months to over a year for the full effect of a rate hike to really to really be felt economically. So if you kind of look back, say, let's say nine months ago, we'll take the average of those two. We were in February or March. That's when the Fed just started hiking. So this last, these last four 75 basis point rate hikes are really barely being felt right now. That, that, that's going to just continue to weigh on the economy, especially as we go into next year. And, you know, at the same time, the Fed is doing Q95 billion of QT every month. It's draining liquidity from the system. In my opinion, that's one of the big reasons we saw the London, the um, British pension funds pretty much fail and get bailed out. It's why F- FTX is a problem. It's it's liquidity is leaving the market. And those that are most susceptible to liquidity are feeling it first. But as that keeps occurring, it's going to slowly work its way into the more traditional asset markets. And we've also seen large governments and central banks be enormous net sellers of U.S. Treasuries. You talked about liquidity there. I mean, mm-hmm. Japan sold almost 10 percent of their total U.S. Treasury holdings in a single month, about $81 billion in net U.S. Treasury sales last month. If you have the Federal Reserve Bank reducing its balance sheet with quantitative tightening and they're not buying as many U.S. Treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. You have Japan, that's a net seller of treasuries, China, Germany, the countries that normally run large trade surpluses and then recycle those trade surpluses and foreign exchange reserves back into U.S. treasuries. If they're not buying U.S. treasuries and the U.S. federal government is still running large deficits, who's going to buy the treasuries then, Michael, if the Fed is reducing its balance sheet so much? Well, there's always a buyer, right? It's a quote-unquote risk-free asset. So there will be a buyer. The question is at what price? Uh, 
right? Who's not going to buy U.S. Treasuries at 15%? That's going to beat any return you're going to get anywhere else. Not not that I think they go anywhere near there. In fact, I'm bullish on Treasury bonds, which we could talk about later. But the important thing to think about when you talk about what Japan's doing and what many of the Europe's doing in regarding selling bonds is they have a currency problem. The dollar has been on a tear. And these countries are trying to support their currencies against the dollar. So what they do is they sell treasuries, they get out of their dollars, and they buy their currencies. They're basically selling dollars and buying uh, yen or buying euro or whatever, pounds or whatever whatever it may be. So they've, they, have been selling tre- they have been selling treasuries. Now, you're right, at the same time. The Fed is also selling treasuries. And at the same time, the U.S. Treasury Department is issuing a hell of a lot of treasuries. So the supply dynamic, supply demand dynamics, you know, just looking at that group is not great. We, but, you know, we also got to remember that ever since 2008, the Treasury Department and the Fed have put a lot of banking regulations in place that, that basically, uh, I'm not going to say force, but make it uh, make it incumbent upon banks to hold treasury debt for collateral. Is it in so it's capital an incentive reasons. basis? It's an incentive based system, then. It, sort of. I mean, they're, they're basically forcing them to buy more. Um, uh, you know, and I would also bet now that we're at yields of four percent, give or take, for U.S. Treasuries regular investors are owning a lot more treasuries. I mean, I know that we, there's not almost not a day that goes by where someone asks us to, if we can add some treasuries to their portfolio. Uh, Here's an example. In early 2020, we were reducing risk significantly. So we sat in cash. We probably, you know, had 30, 40, 50% cash at one point in March of 2020. And it didn't really phase us because treasuries were earning, you know, treasury yields were so low that whether it was in a money market fund, which is cash, or in a treasury security, which was basically earning nothing, it didn't matter. Today, we sit on very, very little cash. We we have a lot of cash, what we consider cash, but we invest that in treasury bills because you, they're yielding 4% and money market funds are still yielding way south of 4%. So are you are you looking at new newly issued treasuries at higher interest rates because correct me if I'm wrong isn't it finance 101 that existing bonds when the Federal Reserve Bank is raising interest rates or the market raises interest rates on its own doesn't um older bonds issued at lower interest rates when interest rates go up, those existing bonds that have been outstanding for one, two, three, four, five years or longer, something like that, those bonds get crushed in value. The principal value of those bonds, bonds are inversely proportional. The principal value of a bond is inversely proportional to interest rates. So wouldn't the existing US treasuries that were issued a couple of years ago, wouldn't they get absolutely crushed then while the Fed has been hiking rates the last 12 or so months? Yes, but it depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at three-month bonds, whether it's an old 20-year bond or a three-month treasury bill, that has already happened. So if I'm going to go buy a three-month bond today, again, it doesn't matter whether it's an old treasury bond that's been around for 20, you know, for 29 years and change or a brand new issue. They are both priced at a yield that is commensurate with what they will return. So if you hold the bond, so right now the three month yield is uh, 4.37%. If I buy an old 30 year bond that has three months to maturity or a brand new three month treasury bill, I will earn on an annualized basis 4.37% for holding that. So yes, if you held bonds this year, you've lost, you know, potentially a lot of capital. But when we're talking about short-term bonds, you're buying it at that yield holding to maturity. Okay, because you brought up the pension funds earlier. I think a lot of these oh. pension funds either they directly own the bonds or from listening to a 
pension fund consultant that was hired to go in there and look at their books, see if there was accounting fraud or the pension fund was being overcharged by some of these hedge funds or private equity people on fees and commissions, and they hadn't marked their assets to market. It looked like a lot of these pension funds, and you brought up the British ones, I think they were getting margin calls and they had over leveraged bond trades while the Bank of England was raising interest rates and then their bonds were getting crushed and they were getting these margin calls. Correct. So a couple of things were going on there. They were leveraged, which automatically introduces risk. So when you have leverage and a position goes against you, you have to come up with collateral to post. They also own British bonds. And British bonds were falling apart The uh, at the time. They were, their yield was rising so rapidly. The price was falling so quickly. And basically because of the leverage these pension funds had, it was devastating. Um, you know, so I'm just looking at a graph again here. In August, very early August, the 10-year British bond was 181. In uh, the end of September, it was 447. That is a incredible move for a bond, almost three percent in yield on a ten year bond is about a thirty percent you know roughly price decline. So again, you have a leveraged asset that dropped called twenty five percent in less than two months. That's a huge problem, and that's why the u k government Bank of England had to go in there and do everything they could to get the yields of their bonds lower. So it's kind of funny, but they were doing QT and QE at the same time. Yeah, it's more bad policy and distortions from governments and central banks. But do you think that U.S. pension funds have similar problems to the British pension funds then? Are they sitting on large losses on these leveraged bond yeah. trades? Maybe they hired a hedge fund that put on an over-leveraged bond trade or copied the risk parity trade. Are they sitting on large losses that they haven't marked down yet? The, the question, it, it, I think it's less about the bonds and more about the leverage. That, And I don't know the answer to that. I know they've been, you know, these pension funds have been getting more aggressive. CalPERS certainly has the biggest one, the California, I think it's teachers. Uh, they've been aggressive. They've been buying private equity. They've been doing other stuff. So it wouldn't shock me. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, if you're a pension fund, and you can invest in a risk-free asset, government asset, for 10 years at, you know, called 4%, that's a that's very helpful. And they haven't had the opportunity to do that in a long, long time. So I, I can't really answer your question because I don't know how much leverage they use, but I'm sure there is one or two that is just over-levered and maybe not failing, but they're probably well below the assets they need than they than they should have to make future payments. The there problem was an article, there was an article from risk.net, which is an institutional investor research website. My hedge one of my other hedge fund manager friends sent me it a, about a month ago that like some of these you a lot of these US and European pension funds actually were getting margin calls every day because they had too much leverage. So there was a lot of over leveraged balance sheets. So you, what you're saying is that they should be buying U.S. Treasuries right now because they can get an attractive yield on it. But if they have margin calls and over leveraged trades on, then they probably they're getting margin calls. They need to raise cash. They probably don't have the extra cash to go and buy a lot of those U.S. Treasury positions right now. Right. But I think each one is unique and different. I don't I, I don't think at this point it's a crisis like it was in the U.K., and a lot of it is because they had the opportunity to sell. They had the opportunity to hedge. In the UK, rates went up so fast that they didn't, they couldn't. Um, so it, it's, they probably act similar, but the markets were very different. And But it also explains why there was, there was in, in September, the bond market, the US bond market, was starting to show signs of illiquidity too, because I bet you a lot of these UK pension funds had US treasuries and they had to sell the treasuries just to meet their margin calls. 
So I want to ask you now about Japan, because it seems that Japan, the Bank of Japan, the Japanese government seems to finally be hitting their limits for 20, 25 years. This was called the Widowmaker trade. People were betting on Japanese government bonds having problems. People were betting on the Japanese yen being massively devalued against the dollar or other currencies, and they failed. That's why it was called the Widowmaker trade, because so many fund managers, their funds all blew up. Now it appears that Japan finally seems to be hitting limits or selling treasuries, like I said earlier. Do you think the U.S. is headed along a similar path to where they will have to make a choice similar to Japan? They will either have to protect their government bond market or they will have to defend their currency because the Japanese finance ministers um, and also the people at the Bank of Japan have basically said they can't do both anymore. Japan's a mess. They've been a mess. Uh, Their economy has not been growing. Their demographics are awful. And for the last, you know, 20 plus years, they have been avoiding the, uh, their real estate bubble from the eighties. Uh, they've done everything they can do to not take those losses. And it is costing that country dearly. And had they just had a depression, most likely taken the losses and moved on, they'd be in much better shape today. But they didn't, and it is what it is. So what they're forced to do is cap interest rates, which is a problem because it means it basically means the Bank of Japan is doing QE, but they're doing QE at a time when inflation is upticking. And inflation for such an indebted country is a death wish. That's the last thing you want. So if you think about the contradictions going on in Japan, it's crazy. Um, and what they're trying to do, they're basically juggling five different balls in the air and trying to um, do the impossible. So the the yen gets killed. You know, it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. They, they keep 10-year yields down and then the currency pops up as a problem they 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 help the currency and something else pops up so you know japan is is and continues and was a big problem but they are not the world's reserve currency the u.s the u.s is and we're i think we're on the same track as japan but we have a lot more runway also, but, because of how like the euro dollar system works and how much uh, dollars are used in global trade, so cross border trade settlement. I mean, a lot more dollars are used globally than Japanese yen. Oh, of course. I mean, you know, when a Philippine company wants to uh, buy something from a Canadian company, they're trading in dollar U.S. dollars. They're not trading in Philippine. What are they ring ringgits or whatever they're called or Canadian dollars? It's U.S. dollars. And there's many good reasons for that. But the bottom line is that everyone needs dollars and everyone holds dollars. So when you hold dollars, you don't hold dollars like you do in your wallet. You hold them in a bank and it then works its way into the financial system. You know, you buy, you end up either directly or indirectly buying treasury bills or, you know, a bank deposit or whatever it is. So it works its way basically back to the treasury one way or another. So um, do, you, do you think then in the next six, eight, nine months, the Fed is going to have to go back then to yield curve control that the U.S. Treasury market, I, I would actually say the U.S. federal government's probably the main problem with the interest rate hike. So not only is it causing problems in asset markets, the real economy with corporate credit and, and consumer credit, other things, the real estate market, other asset prices, but um, also, like the main problem, it appears to me, Michael, looks like interest payments on the national debt. So if the Fed keeps hiking interest rates, won't interest payments on the national debt, they're going to get very ugly in the next six, nine, 12 mm-hmm. months. Yep. Yep. So the Fed, the Treasury relies on a lot of short-term debt, one month, three months, six months, one year, two year. And unlike 10 years, they they are constantly maturing. Um, so if you kind of a, assume that the Treasury were to issue equal amounts of, say, a, a six-month bill and a 10-year, you know, 
periodically, only one-tenth of the 10 years are maturing at any one time. The problem is those six months are all gone within six months. So when the rate goes from one to 4%, the six month all of a sudden is at 4%, whereas only one-tenth of a ten of the 10 years are at 4%. So yes, the 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 interest expense is rising. And I think, you know, at current rates, it's expected to get up to a trillion um, by early mid next year. So that is a problem. And then, you know, this this is where it becomes a little circular because well, what is what happens then? Well, the treasury just issues more debt, right? So now you have more supply which on its own, it's just one of many factors, but on its own forces bond yields higher again. But that sounds like a banana republic then if a trillion dollars per year of our annual tax receipts is going just towards interest payments on the debt. I mean, that's more than our our it's official annual. Hmm? It's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it, it, it's it's the, the difference is we can run it. Because we're the world's reserve currency, because we're the world's defense superpower. A, a banana republic would have failed already. And, you know, you're kind of seeing that in Japan. They're not a banana republic, but, you know, they've run their country like one. Um, but I think our end game is still off. But what I will tell you is that if we get another COVID not another not i'm not necessarily saying disease germ but another bad economic downturn and the government does what it did in 2020 2021 i mean lockdown stimmy checks or a combination of those things well just spending you know fiscal spending to the degree that they spent you are just bringing that that day of reckoning much closer um but yeah, uh, you know, that that's another concern about what happened in 2020 and 2021. The government, the US Treasury learned how to print money. So money that believe it or not the Fed or the Treasury don't print money. Banks print money. The Fed gives them the the ability to print money via reserves, but at the end of the day all money is created via loans. So what what's interesting about what the Treasury did with the Fed's help was they took out loans essentially when they when they you know issue treasury debt they're taken out a loan just like you take out a mortgage uh and they did it to such a huge amount and they did it with the stimulus checks whether it was to people or corporations or you know a whole different place but th- that money went right into the economy versus instead of, like an, in, instead of asset prices in the past right Right. Or versus like an infrastructure type spending where it takes years to work its way into the economy. You got to plan for the project, you know, architecture, the whole nine. It just takes a long time. This was a just a an injection into the economy all at once. So the Fed, the Treasury, not the Fed, well, they both, but the Treasury learned that they now have a printing tool. Um, the tr- The Fed made it possible. The Fed abetted. The Fed sat in the runaway, runaway car out in front of the bank. They they basically bought an enormous amount of treasuries, which limited the uh, the you know kept the interest rate very low, while the Fed was just borrowing as much as they could. You mean the U.S. Uh, Treasury was borrowing as much as yeah, they U.S. Could? Treasury. Uh, so they were in cahoots together. Uh, I don't think it would have if the Fed was not buying bonds. That would have been a big problem in the bond market, which probably w- would have meant that that second round of stimulus checks, the one under Biden, probably would not have happened. Or it would have been much more targeted to those really in need, not to the general public. Um, Listen, since you mentioned so much of the debt is short term, there's many trillions of debt that needs to be rolled over. So the U.S. Treasury is going to have to reissue or roll over trillions of dollars in that existing national debt in the next, what, 12, 18, 24 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why the interest expense is going to rise sharply. But what's fascinating is that the interest expense, the, despite, uh, let me see if I could pull up a chart here. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, well, uh, here it is. I, I think I've payments. seen, 
So if you look at it, uh, I'm not sure this one's it, but if you look at it, interest expense has not really been growing that much because interest rates have steadily come down despite higher amounts of debt. But interest expense is shooting higher right now because you have the combination of a lot more debt and higher interest rates. And every day that goes on, another bond is maturing that used to have a coupon of half a percent or 1% or 1.5%. And it's, it's, they're rolling it over and it's now a three and a half or four or whatever, you know, whatever term it is, 4% bond. So, you know, think about it. If you, um, uh, you know, it's almost like a credit card. You pay it off, but then you, to pay it off, you took out another credit card to pay it off. And that credit card has an interest rate that's 3% higher than the old card. That's yeah, what the, the treasury is doing. The, like government was, the government was also doing similar to teaser rates with Japanification and yield curve control. Because for many years, Michael, I think the interest payments on the debt, even though the debt kept growing, I think the interest payments were only around $300 billion per year, give or take, but they've spiked I think even in 2020, the interest payments on the national debt, which grew a lot with all the extra government spending and the infrastructure and pandemic plans and the bailouts, the interest payments were still 300 around 300 billion per year. They spiked now to around 800 billion per year. And like we said, 2023 is going to be even uglier. A, a base case looks like around a trillion per year in interest payments, which is a very large chunk of the annual U.S. federal government tax receipts. And then on top of that, Michael, you have asset prices. So stocks, bonds, real estate, which are down, and we haven't had this big real estate bust yet. So that's going to hurt tax revenues too. Right. Yeah. So I'm looking at it now. They The interest expense was seven uh, 736 billion. Uh, can't see when it was updated, but that's through the third quarter. So presumably that's through uh, September. Uh, and that's 736. That's up from 602 at the end of the first quarter. That's a big jump. And again, like I said, I think we're supposed to hit a trillion some some point next year. That's a huge line item just for interest. That's just interest. That's not funding the military. That's not funding Social Security or, you know, there's no real benefit. There's no There's no economic benefit to that. That's why I've been saying for the last 12 months that the Fed is fighting a math problem, that they can't win. <laughs> That's right. 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 It's a it's a circular Ponzi scheme juggling act that and that's why my concern is that what happened in 2020 set the tone for what happens in the next bad recession. And that what you're really doing is pushing that day of reckoning up, which maybe it's a good thing. Maybe not. You can debate that all day, but they're, they're making things more precarious. So you put out a Twitter chart in the last 24 hours on your Twitter showing inverted yield curve versus stock market drawdown. So you think then as the yield curve gets more inverted, the Fed either does more rate hikes until the Fed does a full 180. And even then, if the Fed announces that they're doing a 180, the stock market may still not rally enormously then, because in the past, when the Fed has announced 180s, the stock market is still sold off for at least a couple quarters. Do you think then, then that's a high probability yeah. scenario? Yeah. And I think the market, the stock market seems to want the Fed pivot. The market doesn't want a Fed pivot because if the Fed is is the Fed said that they're going to wait for inflation to come back down, right? It's going to take a long time for inflation to get back down to 2%. It's going to take at least a year. Uh, so the Fed, I think, would prefer to raise rates, call it to 5%, you know, four and three quarters, five and a quarter, whatever that may be, and just wait, wait for inflation to drop. And then maybe they'll slowly lower rates. If the Fed has to pivot, mid-year, early year, it means there's a problem. Either the economy is falling apart or there's financial instability. You know, banks well, are having problems. Well, there's companies having problems. Credit Suisse. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, the market's signaling enormous red flags for Credit Suisse right now. The shares are barely $3 a share. So they're either going to have to do a reverse stock split or there's a bailout coming because the shares are below $5 now. The pension funds and the mutual funds, their bylaws, they're going to have to sell the stock unless something changes quickly. Right. But what's interesting is if you look at my graph, you see that the yield curve inverts. It hits a, a trough and then it starts. It's They're all V-shaped. They're all Vs. Right. They come down rapidly. The yield curve comes down rapidly and goes up just as quickly. And so the question, so for it to come back up quickly, what it's basically telling you is that the Fed is pivoting. Why would three month yield start rapidly falling, which would get the curve to it? To, there's only two ways it's going to invert either very short three month yields start dropping quickly or 10 year yields. Um, start rising rapidly. And if 10-year yields start rising rapidly, we got a bigger problem on our hand. So I think when it inverts, it's uninverting because a three-month yield starts falling rapidly, which means that the Fed is pivoting, which means that there's a problem, whether it's financial instability or whether it's economic uh you know, a considerable slowdown in the economy. I don't know what that is, but. Um, or, or real estate bust. I mean, if if real estate goes, that's going to destroy tax receipts at the federal, state and local government level. We haven't had a, the real estate bust yet, like 2007 and eight. But if the Fed keeps hiking rates, that may come. It looks like there's very little buyers right now for a lot of homes and uh, apartments. Right. And like, but, you know, conversely, there aren't many sellers either. Um, I mean, it's just. The market's broke. You know, I think a lot of sellers want to get the prices they could have got a year ago. And but they talk to their, you know, talk to their potential agents and the agents are telling them, well, those prices don't exist anymore. There are no buyers. No one wants a seven percent mortgage. So I think that market is broke for the time being. Um, I know certainly in my neighborhood, these houses are just sitting on the market. We, you know, we haven't seen that in years. Um, they have open houses all of a sudden. They were they didn't have open houses for the last two years because they could sell a house in two days. Yeah, week um, all cash, and there was bidding wars at one point. Uh, and we're in the same market for listeners who are not aware. Michael's local DC metro area. Michael and I have had lunch about half a dozen times in the last five or six years. So Michael's a, a local friend. Yeah, we we actually sold my in laws house uh, about a year ago. I guess it was summer of 21, maybe late uh, fall of 21. And we didn't have an open house. The uh, the agent who's our friend put it on the market like on a Sunday by we and he said and he told agents that at Thursday night at 6 p.m. that's the last chance to submit bids. Between that Sunday and Thursday, there were like 50 appointments to go see the house. 50 different people saw the house, something crazy like that. And there were like six or seven bids on the house, most of them above the asking price, which uh, was a pretty high asking price. That that market is gone. That doesn't exist anymore. Oh yeah, the interest rate hikes have stopped the bidding wars. There was bidding wars, a lot of them. There were or in the DC metro area, so Northern Virginia area, there was 20, 30, 40 people bidding on a on a nice single family home or a luxury condo if it was in the right area. And you'd see bids above 50,000 on the asking price routinely. I mean, sometimes they would get a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand if it was a really nice property. It would get two, three hundred thousand at one point. Uh, 12 months ago. So, I mean, that was before the Fed really started drastically raising interest rates. The interest rates have taken, you said 7% mortgage. I mean, Michael, that's with someone with a perfect credit score. Most people don't have perfect credit scores. Right, right. But, you know, I mean, I think what a lot of people don't think about, you're not really buying a house, you're buying a mortgage payment. (laughs) It's not that no one, very few people can really afford a million dollar house. But they can't afford a, I don't even know what the number would be, a $5,000 monthly payment. So w- when you look at what you can afford, you're looking at your payment. You say, you go through your books and you say, okay, I can afford $3,000 a month. Then you say, okay, what does that buy me in a house? And the problem with you know the combination of higher prices and higher mortgage rates is that people can't afford anything close 
to what's on the market anymore. So something has to give. Well, governments have kept raising property taxes too. So we'll see what happens if property values fall or there's no buyer. So we'll see if people keep wanting to pay higher property taxes. I mean, at some point it's going to break the real economy or people are going to say enough is enough, especially if real estate prices fall and governments try to raise property taxes. And then I think you're going to have a big time backlash. Uh, it, it seems that way. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, Jason, it's important Everything that we've seen since um, Mar- you know February March of 2020 has been new to us, right? I mean, the last time we really had inflation was the early 80s when I was riding a bike to high school, uh, when almost all investment professionals were either just starting or still in college or even in high school or you know middle school. So very few professionals have been around in an inflationary environment. We've never seen the government unleash stimulus the way they did in 2020 and then again in 21. Um, you know, at the same time, you have this whole Russian Ukrainian thing, which is creating problems, much more so for Europe, but it's creating commodity problems. Um, you, you had a speculative bubble once again in 2021 that's slowly popping. So we are in a crazy environment, um, and it, it's just, I think it should be humbling to everyone. And, you know, we, we all have our our forecasts and expectations as to what what we think will happen over the next few months, over the next six months, over the next year or two. But I think it's important to stay humble because a lot can happen. Maybe the Fed gets it right and we get a soft landing. Hallelujah. I don't expect it. I think it's going to be a pretty rough landing. But, but you know, everything that's gone on leads me to, you know, just, just as I forecast, I have my forecast, but I also think about where I think more about how I'm going to be wrong now than I did before COVID. Um. And given yeah. the Fed, given the Fed's track record, I think the probability is pretty low that the Fed is going to get this right and have a soft landing. I have a couple more questions before I let you go. So, if you were sitting down with someone who had stocks and commodities, gold, how would you explain to them why they should own some U.S. Treasuries right now? Why s- some types of U.S. Treasuries would be potentially a good buying opportunity? I personally think U.S. Treasury, long-term U.S. Treasuries, are a steal here. Now, it doesn't mean that their yield will not go up further from here and the price go down in the short term. But I think over the longer term, you know, even starting as three months out and further, you're able to lock in a 4% yield, give or take a little. And what will probably be a very low inflationary environment. So your real yield will be 4% less. Let's just say they get inflation back down to 2% will be 2%. Because of financial repression, that number has been flat to negative for the last 15 years. So I think what's going to happen is inflation starts dropping quickly here as the economy falters. Um, And Fed will slowly start raising rates at some point. I think it'll be later next year. And yields will come down pretty sharply. The steeper the recession, the the more yields are going to come down. And I could see, you know, 10-year yields back below, you know, one and a half percent. So, you know, it's not just locking in a yield at 4%. It's the price appreciation. If you own a 10-year bond and that yield drops by 1%, that's a, a price gain of approximately 10%. So if we're talking about yields dropping 2.5% on a 10-year security, that's a 25% gain on a bond. So yeah, I wrote an article a few weeks ago with the uh, new slogan, bah, bonds are an alternative, kind of countering the Tina uh, saying, there is no alternative, which was for stocks. So I'm Pretty bullish on bonds, fully recognizing that that may look like a bad investment over the next few months, but I think it's really a chance to pick up yield. 
I I think the Fed understands it. I think the Fed will do what it has to do to 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 kill inflation here. And you know, I'm not a big fan of the Fed, but I think for the first time in a long time, they are doing the right thing. And I think they will at least until the pain becomes too much to bear. But right now, there are no signs the pain is too much to bear. So the Fed can't really kill inflation. They can only really try to kill aggregate demand, which is what the Keynesians would say. So they cannot fix any of the supply side problems, any of the higher energy costs, diesel costs, all these problems in the supply chain. They can't fix any of that. So they can only try to kill demand. It may actually end up making things worse with stagflation if businesses do shut down, because then that'll mean even less supply. So we'll see what happens. I think the Fed will probably just make things worse. But to back you up here, the Bank of America Invest Investment analysts with your treasury call, they've actually been predicting now, they put out this work in the last week. I had some hedge fund contacts send me this chart. The Bank of America Investment Research Analysts, they're projecting top performing asset classes for 2023. They have a bunch of US treasuries listed and gold. So they kind of have a dual strategy here, contrarian trades, gold as a safe haven and US treasuries for 2023. But surprisingly, and I don't really see the demand driver for this, they pre- uh, predicted that the top performing asset out of all of them would be copper at over 25%. Hmm. Now, some of, some of the copper may be uh, electric vehicle related. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Um, we know that electric vehicle demand is skyrocketing. At the same time, a lot of the metals are just hard to find, hard to source, especially like lithium. Um, so. You know, possibly what we're seeing there is um, it is electric vehicle related. Um, that maybe could be demand or- coming back online in China as they dump the COVID rules. Or infrastructure if they want to upgrade the electrical grid. But the mm-hmm. problem for copper on the supply side are, are a lot of the mines. I mean, the cost for these low-grade open pit copper and gold mines are up enormously in the last two and a half years because the diesel prices, electricity prices, labor costs in emerging markets, all these costs are up 20, 25, 30% across the board for mining costs while metals prices are weak. Right. Right. So, so- um, hmm? No, I was just going to say, I'd like to read their report to see what, what drives their, what's motivating them. But well, they, they seem, they seem to be uh, betting most of their predictions seem to be on US treasuries and gold, though. So it seems to be kind of a contrarian safe haven play then that the Fed will, I guess, reverse at some point and, lo- and start to lower interest rates again. Right. Could be. Uh, finally, last question here on gold and commodities. And do you think then that, gold or other commodities in the next 6, 12, 18 months, if the Fed does reverse, we'll have some type of rally. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's what gold's pricing in. Uh, Gold is highly correlated with real yields. Real yields are the yield on a treasury bond minus the inflation rate, the expected inflation rate, not the inflation rate. So real yields are very positive right now. So if you kind of think about what that real yield is telling you, real yield should always be positive. Anyone lending money should always expect to earn more money than they had for taking the risk of lending money. Their purchasing power should increase as a result of making the loan. That should be their expectation. Whether it happens is a different thing, but that should be the expectation. So if you kind of think about it, When real yields are positive, the Fed is not unduly influencing yields at that point lower. When real yields are negative, it means the Fed is basically stomping down on yields to the point where they're making it below where they should be based on the market. So I think as inflation kind of works its way lower, as the Fed kind of normalizes things, real yields are going to fall. And I think with that, gold will rise could rise pretty rapidly here and commodities to some degree uh, the problem with many commodities is the economy so uh, you know i understand their supply line issues and all that but at the end of the day people that are laid off don't need to drive back and forth to work they don't need as much gas as they needed they won't be buying as many goods as they would have been buying so uh you know the economy can certainly weigh on 
the economy can weigh on commodity prices, but gold is certainly a unique asset in that, you know, not really a, I mean, it is a commodity, but it's very, it's a financial commodity, not a commodity you use to make stuff or to, you know, to burn. And also we were discussing this before we started recording. And I talked about this on a Twitter spaces with Michael Gaid for the lead lag report on Friday, that gold at some point will have more of a safe haven, excuse me, that gold at some point will have more of a safe haven status because either there's private sector bankruptcies, and that's what happened after the October 1929 crash during the 1930s depression. I had a listener question call in. The guy was trying to lecture me that during the 1930s depression, the only reason gold caught a bid was because people didn't trust government. Well, that might've been part of it. The other major reason was the private sector. There were so many bankruptcies and problems. Asset prices were falling. Consumer discretion were falling. People wanted assets out of the system because look, uh, just look at the headlines. It's almost every day now you're seeing cryptocurrency exchanges with problems, cryptocurrencies exchanges having problems, asset prices falling. We may have a real estate bust. So if these other assets are falling and you're seeing a lot of bankruptcies in other companies and sectors, and industries, other countries are having immense financial problems with their currency. That normally historically, Michael, is good for gold status as a safe haven because you can buy the physical metal and pull it out of the system. That's right. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin cryptocurrencies are having all kinds of issues now. So that just further makes gold a little more uh, powerful than it may have been if cryptocurrencies were hanging in there. And a lot of these institutional investors are drastically under allocated to gold. A lot of them sold their gold over the last 12 months, 18 months. They went into crypto or they went in, they were chasing other asset classes higher. The majority of institutional investors are drastically under invested in any gold or gold stock exposure. I think it's below 1% globally. Right, right. So, you know, right. If it just goes to 2%, you're doubling demand. It's just a... You know, you can't even fathom what it would do, let alone if it, that number goes to three or four percent. So, Michael, I really enjoyed our discussion <laughs> today. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. It's almost an hour. If our, if my listeners want to follow your work on Twitter, take a look at your research articles. How do they do so? So on Twitter, I'm at Michael Leibowitz, L-E-B-O-W-I-T-Z. They can follow everything I write at realinvestmentadvice.com, as well as uh, Lance puts out a a lot of good work too. We tend to be on the same page. Uh, So all our all our uh, free work is there. We also have uh, SimpleVisor, which is a subscription service. Uh, where we show you our stock portfolios. Uh, you know, we have various models in there and uh, some unique articles as well. So uh, Twitter, realinvestmentadvice.com or simplevisor.com. Excellent. And I'll attach a link to your Twitter in the information description section. I want to thank you so much for your time and keep up the good work. I mean, some of the charts you put out there are very thought provoking, especially with the stock market drawdown and the inverted yield curve, because I know a lot of people are starting to buy into the stock market rally. And honestly, I think the Q4 earnings that are going to be coming out, I think they're going to be a lot worse than people think. Yeah, I, I think earnings are in for a, uh, are going to be problematic for the next few quarters. Uh, but again, you got to look at every company. Every company has a unique story. So we shall see. Jason. Yeah, especially with higher interest rates and a lot of these companies over leveraging on debt, we'll have to see what their profit margins are with their higher costs and inflation and if their sales are falling. Because then either if their sales are falling, their cash flow is down, they're going to have debt servicing problems and balance sheet problems. So we'll see what happens with that. Right. Exactly.